Alex Higgins, the people's champion. They call him Hurricane. Hurricane Higgins. A quiet man. A confident man. You'd never notice him in a crowd, but in his own twilight world, Hurricane Higgins is almost a god. He sent shockwaves through the snooker world that something new had arrived on the scene that was quite unusual. He just loved to play, he just loved to entertain, he just loved to, he just loved the buzz. It was great to watch it. He went out on the limb just to give people a type of entertainment that they'd never had before. Did he bring shame on the sport? He did some bad things. Did he kill anyone? No. I was not necessarily his favourite person. He said that the next time I went back home to Northern Ireland, he'd have me shot. Could you face life without snooker, Alex? Could snooker face life without me? I'm sick to hear. Alex was the best player drunk that I ever saw. I never ever knew Alex Higgins to win one bet. You can shed your snooker up your jacket. I am not playing no more. He was ahead of his time. If he was around now, someone like Simon Cowell, they'd be like, you know what, we need this man. My dad was a born entertainer and he was definitely the people's champion. I've had my tears, I shall have a few more. It's just so sad to think that he's not with us anymore. Alex really, from the offset, was his own execution. Alex Higgins, ladies and gentlemen. Alex Hurricane Higgins was found dead at the age of 61 on July the 24th, 2010 in Belfast, the city where he was born and where he grew up. <laughs> Snooker came to pay its respects to the man who had blown a wind of revolution through their sport. This was a fond public farewell. Very different from the corners of Belfast where the young Higgins began to play. Kids at that age, they're very daring and they probably like to do things that they're not allowed to do. And in my case, and other children's case, you weren't allowed to go into the jam pot, the dreaded jam pot, or, or the billiard hall as it was called. And uh, I think perhaps in the beginning that was the attraction. He would have been sort of running about there from nine, ten. Um, but he was then he was going doing messages for them and errands and then he, he he was watching on the sidelines but then when he did start playing he was standing on a box and it would have been maybe with a yard brush you know and um, that's how he learned the trade the hard way I mean me as a 12 year old somebody at 17 was a giant and I was hustling at snooker well, probably one of the reasons why I played the game so fast and I'm so quick around the table is because in the jam pot, when you played with no money and you got a beat, you usually got a cue over the head. And uh, subsequently, I was very elusive. Mummy used to send me around sometimes to bring him around for his dinner, but when you opened the door, it was really dark inside and you couldn't see nothing. It was all smoking. You just heard balls popping. And that was it, really. Because when you went and said, is our Sandy there? Mommy says he's to come home. No, he's not here. Um, but we knew he was there, like. <laughs> as soon as school was finished, I would play a solid four hours. I mean, my sister used to come up to the snooker club and, and pull me out and say, your tea's ready, you've got to go down and have your tea. But I'd gulp my tea down, I'd be back up to play again. My mother was orphaned when she was 11, and she always taught us to be there for one another. Um, I was ha we didn't have much in them days and I, but you always got your good dinner. Actually, well, it was our school dinner money we used to spend. In the, instead of dinners, we had a Mars bar and a Coca-Cola and a game of snooker. And if you had six pins left, you'd, you'd play for a tenner a game. 
Snooker had a rival. Alex shared his father's love of horse racing and a flutter. My father liked to bet, so he got into maybe going down to betting for my father, and he just loved gen horses in general. You know, he thought they were wonderful beasts. His reading, he would read about horses, and that's when he decided that he wanted to be a jockey. And he went away when he was 15 for to be a jockey. Never on the ball. He was never doing what he should be doing at the right time and in the right place. He seemed to find it very difficult to focus his energies onto the things that we thought he should be doing. <laughs> they can't ride to start with, so they are supposed to work, clean the yard up. And every time you came back in, there was never a sign of a broom or a rake, and he was normally over at the bookmaker's office. <laughs> He was just 15, but he wasn't going to be told what to do. He was done with riding. He went back to Belfast, back to snooker. If I had any money, I would go to the hotbeds of snooker, so to speak. I'd go to the Crown on the Shankill Road. I'd go to places in the Falls Road. I'd go to the Shaftesbury, the Oxford, and North. Uh, all these clubs were all the reputed and notable players used to play, and I used to go on lose my money, but it was like serving uh, an apprenticeship. You know, he'd come from a very poor working class area, uh, a very tough area in Belfast. Uh, he'd, he'd paid his dues, if you like, in the billiard halls, which is a bit like an old time comedian doing the working men's clubs before he goes to the Palladium. But he was hardened to that. In 1968, Alex Higgins uh, won the British team championship for Belfast YMCA, more or less single-handed and he played so well so brilliantly that uh, a few enthusiasts fixed him up with exhibitions i'd won the british junior billiards championship i'd been living in england for a year and my club brought me back to Cull island and they brought alex higgins down from belfast to play an exhibition in gervin's club here i was very nervous and alex arrived in the club we were both 18 at the time and uh, we were out in the sticks here and i thought this is a cocky little fella coming from Belfast here. Uh, I wonder how good he is. And then when Alex started playing, I'd never seen anybody play the game quite like this. You could call that the luck of the Irish. He was so fast around the table, you know, hustle and bustle, and uh, he was a bit special. When I won the world title in 1970 in London, while I'm waiting for them to make the presentations, suddenly, I became aware of someone standing at my side. And yes, it was he, young Alex Higgins, 18 year old. And he didn't say to me, well done for achieving your life's ambition. He said, I'm playing you in three months time up on the northwest coast and I'm going to bump you. Professional snooker is a sport that has been largely ignored by all but the most dedicated of followers. Hurricane Higgins, if he achieves his ambition, may change all that. Who knows? He could bring to snooker the same air of glamour and appeal that George Best has given to soccer. Nobody really knew anything much about the snooker game at the top. You know, it was just somewhere here for the boys to go to mm -hmm. and, and play. Um, we just thought maybe something the way you'd go to a youth club, you were going in and doing this. My, my father didn't know. He used to say that, oh, he's away playing that silly old game, snooker. Snooker in the 60s was very much a folk sport. Uh, a lot of people played, but the professional game was virtually dead. The atmosphere in the match room was uh, uh, cathedral-like. Uh, the tranquility of the room itself was only disturbed by the click of the bulls or somebody having a cough. Immaculate dress wear and high polished shoes etc for evening sessions. To be honest, Snooker was boring before he came on the scene and I don't mean that to disparage any of the previous players but they all played in a very sedate way and it was sort of exemplified by Ted Lowe's sort of whispering voice and everybody sort of was a very relaxed thing and suddenly in came this vibrant young excitable guy that they all thought oh he's gonna he's gonna mess it up and sometimes he did but when he got it right he was unbelievable. I remember the great Joe Davis saying that uh, 
you know, how does he pot a ball? He, he's moving on the shot, he's lifting his head. But everything must have just come right when Alex made contact with that ball when he was at his best. His timing was just spot on. Alex Higgins took an Edwardian parlour game into the modern generation because people, snooker's a long game. If you're not really into the sport, it can be quite dull, particularly when there's safety play or Cliff Thorburn's playing or whatever. Higgins, you couldn't take your eyes off him. He was twitching, he was drinking, he was smoking. He was, you know, he was around the table. It was just mesmerizing to watch. It was soon time to leave Belfast again, not as a wannabe jockey now, but as Snooker's one-man revolution. He uh, came to England in 1971 under the auspices of uh, John Spencer, uh, who in fact uh, persuaded him to turn professional. Blackburn was the first uh, area that he arrived in, but I remember on uh, Press New Road, not far from where I used to live, we did find a little sort of flat for him there. At that time I was working with the television domestic appliance company, and I, I got a TV, installed the TV for him, and, uh, and that was it, off he went. Higgins was 22 years old, young, brash, and fast. During the game, he made a break of 67, and a voice came out of the audience, which said 67 in one minute, 34 seconds. Now that is the first time I've ever heard of time put to pot in balls. And I thought, how oh, fantastic. I mean, it's a showman's game. So I potted the last head and I turned around to the audience and I said, one red, one second. You know, be that your little what have you, you say. <laughs> yes. A lot of people might claim to have uh, given Alex, uh, the hurricane nickname, but it was John Taylor uh, in Blackburn, no relation to myself, who used to write a column in the local paper under Cuman. And uh, when he seen Alex play, it was him who gave him the, the nickname Hurricane. And sure enough, that remained with him for the rest of his life. He played like what they called him, like a hurricane. He just whizzed around the table and he done things that nobody expected him to do. He was unpredictable. They said he'd never get that and he would go and do it. Is that right? He was just so magnetic, you couldn't take your eyes off him. In Blackburn, there was a couple of uh, local businessmen who owned bingo clubs, John McLaughlin and Jack Leeming, they were called. And they played a bit of snooker themselves, just, just for fun. And uh, they thought that they were saying something a bit special, and they took Alex under their wing. His live possessions, as I saw them, I, I asked him what he got, and he said, I'm stood here, and I've got my cue, and that's all I need. Remember, Alex played for cigarettes and a meat pie for his lunch. He didn't know money at all. And uh, they got him sorted out, got him nicely dressed, bought him loads of clothes. I remember they used to send him to the dentist and he had all his teeth sorted out. <laughs> and they managed Alex for a few years and arranged an awful lot of matches, exhibition matches, and he used to play against John Spencer and Ray Reardon. They were the big names at the time. And his first world championship in 1972, he played the great John Spencer in the final. In those days, staid, steady snooker attracted little media attention. Higgins was about to strip away at shyness. How would you sum up your position in the snooker world today? I would say at this time I'm in the top two. And uh, after next week in Birmingham, I think uh, I'll be the top one. It was his first year as a professional, his first world championship, and here he was in the final. The 1972 world final was uh, about as different from what we expect at the Crucible as it's possible to imagine. It took place in a down at heel British Legion, now demolished on the outskirts of Birmingham. Uh, the only lighting was uh, the upturned trough type shade over the table. The tiered seating was on beer crates. The ladies, I remember, was ruthlessly appropriated by hordes of gents. The place was packed out uh, for a week. On the second evening, there was a power cut because there was a minor strike uh, on at the time. They brought in a mobile generator. Amidst all this, Higgins produced an absolutely magical Thursday evening session. It was a week's match. The score was 21 all at the time, and he ran through Spencer 6-0, and he won by six frames at the end. And 
that was a session which saw Higgins at his most inspired, a virtuoso exhibition. It's just a shame there was no telly. Actually, at this moment, I think I'm in a bit of a daze. Although I think I'm just starting to come out of it, you know, and realize that I'm uh, the world champion. Nothing in snooker was sacred now. The sport had just crowned its youngest world champion ever. I obviously grew up knowing all about Alex Higgins. Everybody in Ireland knew about him. He was this inimitable individual who had a, a flair about him, who was really exciting, who was uh, sexy and young. And he brought all the things to the game that we hadn't seen before. The prize money for the world champion of 1972, 400 pounds. And this was the only tournament in town. The world's finest players had to make their money on tour going from club to club for exhibition matches. The man who took the snooker world by storm by winning the World Professional Championship in his very first year as a pro, ladies and gentlemen, the Irish American himself, Alex Higgins! Spencer and myself, and he, were the three names clubs wanted, really. I, and you finish up, I mean, the three of us there on odd occasions, but generally speaking, there was two of us. And Alex was always wanted for the exhibitions because of the way he played the game. So he would fill any club out playing exhibitions and, and do some trick shots uh, at the end of it. It was rough sometimes. There was people climbing off the rafters to see. Um, so he didn't know what he was going to do next. I mean, I, I remember playing him in Sheffield, in a small theatre in Sheffield. And he turned up, and he had two black eyes. Hardly been a bed, been up all night. It's so funny to me, I thought it was wonderful. Really. I walk on the table and look at him, I thought, no, he won't be able to see much out of those two. <laughs> and he goes and puts everything inside, you know. <laughs> Amazing, wonderful, love it. <laughs> it's always nice to be late, but I mean, you have to rush your food and the rest of it. <laughs> I think he was very lonely at times. Oh, yes. I don't personally think that he was ever well looked after because matches were made from end of one Sorry. country to the other end and they were chauffeur driven. My brother wasn't. My brother was on enough train. And he couldn't drive. So I think he was mistreated in many ways over the years. Very much so. Sorry. Look, I haven't been home for three days. Just three, please. Four oh. days. Good night, everyone. Snooker was about to be relaunched in a brand new vehicle, Colour Television. And first of all, let's meet Alex Higgins. <laughs> and his opponent, Doug Mountjoy. <laughs> In comes referee Sidney Lee, and your commentator is Ted Lowe. From Ireland, Alex Hurricane Higgins. This was a whole new world of snooker. And the star of the spectacle, the Hurricane. Everybody knows they'll be shooting when he gets into town. Cause everywhere he goes, trouble always seems to follow him around. His reputation's that of the fastest gun. Across the nation, the Cuban to take him on. When Alex Higgins burst on the scene, he was the breath of fresh air that, that the game had sort of wanted. He was a major player in bringing about and changing the perception of snooker. He was ahead of his time, you know, if he was around now, someone like Barry Hearn and Simon Cowell, they'd be like, you know what, we need this man. That's why he was the jewel in the crown for so long. He was the sort of guy that everybody wanted to watch. And I didn't have time to do my hair. <laughs> Snooker mostly spent its time trying to achieve respectability. And that was not the kind of thing th that Alex was interested in. Um, he was contemptuous of authority. I like all the things that a fellow at 25 likes, including my wine, women and song. And I don't think I should be de deprived of that sort of thing just because I play snooker. Give me, give me that package. I'll have that rather than someone who's a steady player and, and it does some amazing shots, but he was never predictable. Everyone loves a bad boy, don't they? Oh. 
women in particular love vulnerable bad boys. His army of supporters tended to attract or include those people who had not much good to say about established authority either. You've got to think about some of his friends, you know, Oliver Reed, Keith Moon. This wasn't a guy who hung around with snooker players particularly. He hung around with the glitterati. The more outrageous things one does these days, the more publicity you get, the more famous you become and the more money you earn. <laughs> he was a showboater and he loved adulation. Whereas Hendry or Davis, for example, would focus. Nothing existed outside that green base. Higgins, you know, he turned up with the Stetson on, or um, when the WPBSA tried to make an example of him, sometimes with good reason, because he misbehaved, they tried to get him to wear a tie. Um, but he'd forever be taking them off and whipping it away like that. So they, uh, somewhere down the line, he, he was under disciplinary action for not wearing a bow tie. And I always felt it was like, quite ironic that a number of years later, we decided to try and capture the market of the younger generation by wearing coloured shirts, and no bow ties. And then if you did wear a white shirt and a bow tie, you would be disciplined. And I always felt that Alex would have just loved that because that would be the first time he would have worn a white shirt and a bow tie. Alex Higgins was the people's champion, but the people expected, demanded, a non-stop performance from their champion. He was the sort of guy that when he, when he played snooker, he felt compelled to entertain people. It wasn't just to win the game. If it meant that him taking a chance or taking a risk, he went out on a limb just to give people the form of entertainment that they'd never had before. I think that Alex loved the limelight even more than he loved winning. He loved to take the exhibition snooker sometimes into the match snooker and uh, the crowd would be behind him and he'd play a flare shot and it could cost him, it could cost him dearly. Alex led Cliff Thorburn 9-5 in the 1980 World Final and to achieve that lead he played a very measured, balanced game. But somehow or other, that wasn't enough for him. Uh, and when he had that lead, he started to open up, play to the gallery rather more, and Cliff Thorburn was too good a player to take that sort of liberty with. The death or glory shootout was what I think he was unconsciously hungering for underneath all the time. And of course, if it comes down to virtually the turn of a card, you can always lose in that situation. And I think he lost more close ones than he actually won. The 80 World Championships is a good example where he was looking to shock he was looking to amaze you, and he weren't fighting Joe Frazier, but it was the same feeling in his head. He didn't just want to win. He wanted to win it his way. Alex, a tribute from a champion there, and you know what the crowd think about it, but you must at the moment be the most disappointed man in the world. I've had disappointments before, but I'll bounce back. The thing is, I lost the match, really, uh, the third session, when I was 7-3 in front. Uh, my old crowd please and bit come back again. Yes. Uh, but uh, it's hard to live with, but I mean, I, I do, but I'll bounce. He was a player of great moments, competitively, rather than a great player in terms of consistency. But that was part of his attraction, uh, because you never quite knew what was coming next. In the new age of snooker, there would soon be a fresh crop of outrageous talents. Cue Jimmy White in the semi-final of the World Championship of 1982, when the whirlwind met the hurricane. Jimmy and Alex are absolute best friends. They loved each other. Um, and uh, it's very hard when you're playing your best friend. You know, Jimmy modelled his game on Alex. I was watching him putting these drinks down and I was thinking, well, you know, this has got to be in my favour somewhere along the line. But um, <laughs> he, he produced. Jimmy looked like he might win the world title that year. Probably was favourite. Can you get the feeling, Jack, this could be the winning break? 13. They reckon it was one of the greatest matches ever. You know, I didn't have any safety game at the time. I was just going for everything. And that really is a delightful shot to get around the angles, getting on the right side of all the reds. I was just pleased to be playing him. You know, I was just delighted to be playing my hero in the World Championship. So Alex breathes again. 
59 points in front now. And still enough points on the table for Alex if he can just take his opportunity. I, I think he only played his best when he was back to the wall. The pressure was on. Nobody thought he had a chance. And he would somehow manage to get his way out of trouble. One. He almost missed the first shot. And because of that, he lost position on his intended colour, which from memory was pink to middle. And this left him with a safety or a long green. And without hesitation, he just swept in this long green, which as it happened, was a natural cannon onto a safe red on the other side cushion. Fantastic long green you've got in there. That was the only time he didn't drink was when he was uh, on the table. <laughs> when you talk about perfect clearance, was far from it. That's what made it so exciting because till he got to the last thread, he lost position on every shot. There was one shot at one time that he could have snooked Jimmy behind the yellow, but he decided to take the black on in the left hand uh, black pocket. And he kept grinning up. I think it might even have been to John Spencer, I think, who was in the commentary box, as if to say, well, you know, what did you think of that shot? <laughs> you know, because he pulled off some of the most extraordinary pots in that break. Now another difficult red into the centre pocket. He asked the referee on a number of occasions, you know, what's left? And then he would work it out, and then he would swing around the table and look into the audience and wink and smile. And it was great, it was great to watch. It was another element to snooker that we hadn't seen before. And later in that break, he played another extraordinary shot. It was a screw back from the blue, which was on its spot. And Alex not able to afford any mistakes, or else it could be the end of the match. I've set it up a few times, and um, I don't know how he created so much backspin with a flick of his wrist. Looks as if it's going for the blue into the top right-hand corner. And then another tremendous shot. He actually overhits it and ended up by the black. It was just a crazy shot. And he had so much side, as well as backspin on the cue ball, that the cue ball hit one side of the middle pocket and came back over the other side. I, I just don't know to this day how he got that much spin on the ball. He could have set it up another 20 times and maybe not pulled it off, but he pulled it off in that semi-final of the World Championship. Oh, and that's a beautiful shot. When you understand the significance of getting to the final and what was at stake and you know, being on the precipice of being knocked out, to keep on knocking the balls in was just amazing. One of the most amazing things I've ever seen. 27. I've watched it a dozen times, 20 times, and there's still five or six balls that still shock me, having watched tens of thousands of frames of snooker. I'm feeling nervous for him, Jack. I think if he clears this, this would be the break of the tournament. And here we have the colours on their spots. Yes, Jack, all easy shots, these, normally. But everyone a pressure shot in this situation. Looking back at it now, it's just a phenomenal break. I've seen it a hundred times and it's still, still an amazing break under the circumstances. Just has to hold it together for five more shots. Tremendous break, this. He's on the blue here for the blue, pink and black. I'm sure everything looks really easy to him now after the miracle shots he's produced. Beautifully on the pink. And he needs the pink and the black. And he's on the black. And... What a fabulous break if he knocks this black in. Oh, marvellous! He just swaggered back to his seat and he just gave the press box a wink and I was like, Alex, you still got another frame to win, but the confidence of the man was just to say, you know what, that was good. And it was like, you know what, I'm going to win the next frame. You know what, I'm going to win the World Championship. To me, that's the biggest memories I've got, not just Alex, but in a snooker. And he couldn't, he couldn't script that. Yeah, that was amazing clearance there. Uh, I looked like I'd been hit by a train there. But uh, it was one of the best games I've ever been involved in and they reckon one of the best clearances ever. I definitely agree with that. 
So Jimmy Watt concedes. And what a splendid finish. And a truly, truly superb semi-final. So the people's player now has a chance to really be the people's champion. Not only did he produce the most amazing clearance ever, it will never be matched, but he was also able to go on and win the last frame. After 10 years, he was about to reclaim a title that he really wanted to win every year, and perhaps in some ways wanted to win it so much that his character wouldn't allow him to play a game to win it. That's a real statement on Alex Higgins, that although it meant everything in the world to him, he would still not change the way he played. I don't think there's one snooker player uh, that you'd meet wouldn't say that that's the best clearance ever. I, I'm aghast, or I just don't even know why I'm playing so well, because it was only about a month ago that John Spencer beat me 6-0 in the, the Highland Masters, and uh, to be, be perfectly honest, I haven't practiced at all. So it's a mystery to me why, at this time, I've, I've uh, suddenly started to play so well. Of course, there was still the final. Ten years after beating John Spencer for his one and only world title, could he now do it again against Ray Reardon? After Alex had got through to the final, having beaten Jimmy White, I still expected uh, Ray Reardon to beat Alex because Ray was six times a world champion. You know, Alex had only won it the once. And for Ray to get to the final was big news as well because he possibly, you could argue, the twilight of his career. So they both had reasons to want to win it. I watched that bit, but Anne and Mommy were hiding up the stairs. They couldn't watch the television. So they couldn't? No, I couldn't. Uh, now and again, you come down to peep. <laughs> so you did, but it was just too much for me and my mommy. I think it was just all the way through was a feeling of, he could do this. And it's 10 years since he won it, you know. Because you didn't know what really he was going to do next. So you were waiting, oh, please, do it this way, Sandy, do it this way. He actually didn't entertain so much in that final. He was a bit more tactical. He was nip and tack right throughout, really. He got up to 15, 12 in front on the last day. And then they won the three frames before the end of the first session in the evening and we've gone 15 all. It was 15 all and then Alex played three very good frames. He did win it again in this kind of dramatic way that uh, he liked to win. In fact, he knocked the lot in in the last frame. Total clearance. Excellent. But nothing, couldn't do anything about that. No. I'd like to think that Alex wanted just to stamp himself one way or the other as a great, great player. And I think he felt, if I have to compromise my attacking play, I want to win. Ray Reardon has sat in his chair for the whole of this final frame. I think that was a mature victory and quite unusual for Alex Higgins. Fantastic. And the Embassy World Snooker Champion for 1982 is Alex Hurricane Higgins. It was an amazing achievement after a 10-year gap to lift the world title again. Completely exhausted is Higgins. I remember watching the 82 final where he beat Ray Reardon and I, I remember specifically the end when his wife Lynn came in with their little blonde baby, who's gorgeous. And I think we all remember the, the bit at the end when it was my baby, give me my baby, you know. And that was a, a beautiful bit of publicity, wasn't it? It was a pinnacle of uh, Alex's career. I think he just let all his emotions out. It wasn't done for the camera. He just wanted to kiss his daughter. That was the sweet side of Alex Higgins that not a lot of people knew. There's not many people my age who can have a, a moment that's captured in time with your mum and dad. Um, and I just think that it shows how emotional my dad was when he was kind of crumpling the cheque up and he just wanted me to come on. I think that 
he was so happy about winning uh, the title and, and he just wanted to celebrate it with us. He did play from the heart and when you're doing something at that level, when it's all finished, then you revert back to the things you love. So those moments of calling for his family were, yeah, those tears were genuine. They weren't, they weren't for the crowd. He was an emotional person anyway, you know, away from the snooker. He would have been quite emotional and he, he could cry, you know, so I would say it just was a build up of everything and just real happiness that he had achieved it. I've watched this so many times um, and before it's just such a nice thing to watch but obviously now my dad's gone actually it does make you feel quite upset watching it this is the first time I've watched it since my dad's died and all I can think about is it's my dad and since he done it everyone does that now brings her wife down to get their trophies in any sport. No one had ever seen that before. So that and then when, when he always come home from tournaments, he would have sat up and nursed Lauren and cuddled with her. He spent the time at night with her that he couldn't spend during the day. And then chewing her dummy tit and knowing that the child was with him even when he was playing. This comfort blanket. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It was a tremendous thrill for him, obviously. I remember him saying afterwards, this will set Lynn and Lauren up for life. Alex was back in the big time. Ladies and gentlemen, the world snooker champion, Alex Higgins. It's Alex Hurricane Higgins, and who's not just the fastest, but also the most entertaining player on the circuit. <laughs> but when it came to stability, he was all at sea. His marriage to Lynn soon ended in divorce. My dad's always been a part of our lives though, even, you know, when my parents have got divorced and even it's come to our home where, where my mum lives and, you know, sometimes there'd be arguments, sometimes they get along, um, just like everybody else really. I used to like that. It's like a carrot. You know, you ask yourself why a player of Alex Higgins' ability only won the World Championship twice. And the reason probably behind that is that the consistency in his life was something that just didn't exist at, on a personal level or on a playing level. Alcohol had always had a hold, but after the divorce, it grew a whole lot tighter. And Alex sober could be the most pleasant person you'd ever sit down and talk to. And the demon inside him and the Jekyll and Hyde character that was Alex Higgins, when he was fueled by alcohol, was the biggest pain you've ever met. Maybe it was a little bit of frustration at times because Alex was only playing 50% of what he used to play and, and sometimes that's, it's a bit hard to take that. The distractions had a damaging effect on his game and this was no time to be missing out. In late 1982, Barry Hearn announced the formation of his matchroom team, a stable of the world's best players. One name was missing. He would have been a nightmare to manage. It was really great to watch him, but we don't really want him with us. You know, so in a way we were feeding off a bit of Alex's fame, but at the same time not opening the doors and you know, bringing him into the fold. And because we were identifying that snooker was coming into big time business really, and you know, certain responsibilities to TV companies and sponsors and PR performances and all that, you know, Alex wasn't reliable enough to be brought into that. Matchroom was clean-cut, corporate-friendly snooker, and no player was better at it than Steve Davis. Alex would have recognised in Steve Davis the opposite of himself, somebody who was very balanced, controlled, calculating, played the percentage game at a very high level. He was everything that, uh, that Alex wasn't. And I think Alex, once he'd had a few batterings from Davis, was really on edge that 
Not only did he not want to lose, he didn't want to get humiliated. And there was a few times when he was, and that didn't sit well with Alex Higgins. There were one or two exceptions. Extraordinarily, the 83 UK final. Alex replied. Alex came from 7-0 down to win 16-15. And when he did win, he milked it. Yeah, I think he beat me, I think, in the Masters. And he was like, we're fighting back that moment. And, and the, you know, he loved the fact that they were all coming forward to it. And he'd he shake hands with them all night long. But that part of it, you, know, you can't make yourself like that. It's whether you are that way inclined. There was a huge respect from Alex towards Steve. I'm uh, very, very pleased to have won. I mean, evidently, uh, there's no love loss between Steve and I, but equally, I think we both appreciate each other's talents. He is a very hard player. Coupled with probably an intense dislike of the success he'd had, playing the game in an entirely different way to the way that Alex thought the game should be played. If I keep this up, no more seven frame starts. Anyway. <laughs> I don't know what he thought of me as a person. I, to be quite honest, I, I, it wouldn't really be something that was a problem, even if he thought I was the most boring person in the world. Obviously, no smoke without fire. But he probably felt as if I didn't play the game with enough panache and in the cavalier style of, say, Jimmy or himself. Now I know what I, I can become uh, and it's just a matter of discipline all the way around and uh, well I think I've, I've certainly proved it today. Gentlemen thank you for a tremendous game of snooker. It was incredible wasn't it? Another hand. <laughs> <trick. Okay. laughs> I think Steve was physically frightened of Alex because of the uncertainty of what he was going to do and who he was. I think the only time we were ever together for any length of time was on an early flight over to Canada. And I was so nervous on the flight, having to spend seven or eight hours on a plane, trapped with Alex. He probably felt the same way. I, I knocked a beer all over me. I just, I don't know, I was a gibbering wreck. And he was so nice, you know, because it was a mode he was okay in. And we had a good chat, you know, I felt like it was a different person. But then, of course, a few more beers later, by the end of the flight, perhaps it was a different story. On a snooker level, there was a lot of mutual respect, but you can't imagine the difference in personality between the two. I think because Steve was established in those mid-term, mid-80s and early 90s as unquestionably the world number one, you know, Alex wanted to be the world number one and he wanted people to give him the attention and the acclaim that, that, that is bestowed on a number one. I'm sick of all the honey and the vitamin pills and all the rest. I did everything right and I got stuffed. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know and I, I haven't had a vodka for eight weeks. You know what I mean? <laughs> and I, I think the game's not straight, you know, and what's gone wrong? The fire still burned, but consistency was the new mantra. The champion of inconsistency lost more frequently. His frustrations grew and so did his addictions to booze and betting. Well, Alex was the best player drunk that I ever saw, but sometimes his game was out of control because of it. People might say, oh, look, he's drinking orange squash. Well, yes, he was, but uh, there was plenty of vodka in it as well. My dad never got up in the morning and had to start drinking. Um, my dad was more of a binge drinker, and I think that was due to, as well, the, the type of work that he did, you know, and he went to events in the evening. But I think his gambling was worse than his alcohol. He loved gambling. I never, ever knew Alex Higgins to win one bet. He lost every single time. I used to do my money in regular. Never used to win. One time I heard he put an obscene amount of money on the horses. Um, and it, I'm sure that wasn't the only time that he put obscene amounts of money on. I don't think he won many though, that's the problem. <laughs> but he still enjoyed it and he still carried on. I remember him at Royal Ascot and we were talking in the days when £20,000 was probably worth, I don't know, £250,000. And, you know, and he would be betting that type of money on, on races all over the place because he would come racing with pocket loads. There was a new habit losing and here was one very bad loser he was the worst loser um, you've ever seen no one beat him it was um, it was the run of the balls or so but that was the way it was but after after half an hour or so of moaning and sacking everybody around him he was back to normal there was always a sense of threat in the air when we were in alex's company 
and particularly when he'd lost, it wasn't good to be in the same hotel bar late at night uh, as, as he was. It all came to a head at the 1986 UK Championship. Somebody arrived breathlessly with the news that Alex had headbutted the tournament director, Paul Hatherall. So all of us swarmed down the stairs, and there is Alex just outside the tournament office, demented and flailing, an awful scrum going on. It was just crazy. We was there. We was there. We was, um, we was in the other room. Um, he'd had some sort of argument with Paul Avril, I think the guy's name was, but there were some other issues going on, and Paul Avril come in and said, like, you've got to do this drug test. And apparently he just flipped, and um, he headbutted him, apparently. I'm sure there was words said, and something, something triggered something in Alex, and once it triggered, that was it. All bets were off, he's out of control, and he's going to do anything. And he's going to do the first thing that comes into his head. Goes back to the old jam pot days. You know, bosh, have one of those. And you think afterwards, where did that come from? But, he's hit him. That was him just snapping. That was uh, one of the worst things he ever done. He did regret doing that. Tonight, in bizarre headgear, Higgins emerged from his house to talk about the day's events. I've been to see the police today about um, allegations that were made against me, and uh, they are pending. And the ideal thing is that I turn around and have to wait the outcome. Oh, my phone. Golly gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Could be my solicitor. Turn around this way a little bit. Hello? Business going well. Send more money. Alex, like this way. It's Sid. Yes. Could you face life without snooker, Alex? No more questions. Could snooker face life without me? In typical showman style, he appeared on live television to hear his punishment. The bad boy of snooker gets dragged up in front of his peers. What, what have they done to him? Well, they fined him £12,000 and suspended him from the next five tournaments. But the thing is, there's, if I can chip in... Of course, please. Uh, with this type of tribunal and with the rules that the WPBSA carry, uh, there is no right to appeal. So the truth of the matter is that I've decided to accept the punishment and come back fighting. More trouble soon followed. During a world team event in 1990, he lost his rag again, and not with just anyone. This time, he turned on his old friend and fellow Irishman, Dennis Taylor. Alex happened to lose his frame, and he was very annoyed he didn't, you know, at losing. Unfortunately, there was a, a few of the press around, or one press man that, that heard Alex, um, uh, he just lost it completely and said that, the next time I went back home to Northern Ireland, he'd have me shot, you know, which, which was quite a, a bit of a shot, but you could, you could take things sometimes with a pinch of salt that Alex used to say. But he did say something very personal besides that. Uh, it was something, a family thing, that, you, that I've never repeated to anyone since that day, and I never would repeat it. But, and that was one of the reasons why I didn't speak to Alex for quite a few years. The late 1990s. Here was a man approaching 50, a shadow of his former self, and still heading inexorably in one direction, towards rock bottom. Alex remained in the arena after everybody else had left, sitting at the table as if he was unwilling to relinquish the limelight. He was well into drink, and I remember him coming into that uh, press conference, and Colin Randall, the press officer, was wearing a World Professional Billiards and Snooker Association blazer, and he was therefore a symbol of the authority that Alex hated. And so he let him have this, this awful punch. Well, chaps, uh, I think that he knew that he was going to be suspended anyway, and so there was a half-hearted attempt to preempt that with a, some sort of retirement speech. So I would like to announce my retirement profe from professional studio. I remember, I think it was about 10 or 11 at school, and it was when he was on the television and he did a press conference and he was absolutely bottled and he was saying that he was going to retire from snooker. Um, but again, at that age, you're just thinking more about, oh my goodness, stop, please stop talking and don't, don't 
turn the camera off. You can shove your snooker up your jack, say, I'm not playing no more. And, and it's not so great, it's nothing. It's the truth, because the hurricane doesn't want to be part of this tribe anymore. No disregard to the northern people, because they like tribe. I like it as well. I don't want to play anymore. Just go, oh no, no, don't but say that. <laughs> that. That was him. He, you know, he, he just didn't. He just told it as it was, the truth, and that's that's what the interview was about. Not only uh, is it a corrupt game, it's also. Oh. Alex, when did you take the Excuse message? me, I haven't finished. I remember that press conference. I have not finished. There were one or two nuggets of truth tucked away in his rambling. Rock on, Tommy. I think he was ill-treated at times by uh, the snooker establishment. Uh, but he was just cutting a very pathetic figure. Uh, I was supposed to be the stalwart of the game. The guy that took all the brunt, or well, the kid that took all the brunt, is absolutely sick up to here and further about taking all the shit, and I'm not prepared to take it any longer. No more snooker for the hurricane. Well, obviously, you can't physically hit an official, um, so something had to happen to him. Banned for 12 months, the hurricane had blown itself out. The force of nature was utterly spent. That was sort of the finish of him trying to play competitive snooker. If you fall out the top 16, top 32, You've got to qualify, you know, it's everyone's entitled to have their place. I don't think he was humiliated, I think it was more frustration because the, the crowds wasn't there. There was, there's only small booths, you can only hold 10, 20 people. So um, he found it hard to adapt. And bear in mind that the competition was getting better and better and better. And there was 100 Steve Davis clones, Stephen Hendry clones, it's very difficult for someone like Alex Higgins to recapture the days of 72 when there was just a handful of people in the World Championships and they were the old guard and Alex could be the new, young, brave renegade. It was in disputes over money and managements and um, he stopped practising so he didn't really do the exhibitions and when he'd done the exhibitions, because he'd not been practising, he couldn't entertain and because he couldn't entertain, he got frustrated, and also the follow-on to that is the promoters didn't want to know. There was no happy ending to the story of Alex Hurricane Higgins. He was diagnosed with throat cancer in 1998 and came back to Belfast to be closer to his family. We were crying, we were quite annoyed. He just put his arms around the two of us and said, look, I'm not here to die. I'm here for you to look after me and for me to get better. We went to see him in hospital and he hadn't been eating and and it was just awful because my dad's quite a fighter and it's it's when you've never seen someone in a, in a vulnerable situation it's just not something that is very nice. He put up an unbelievable fight against the, the cancer. He fought just as hard against that as he used to do on the snooker table but that was uh, that was just a battle that uh, he couldn't win in the end, but he certainly gave it his best shot, that's for sure. We had an argument last year. I didn't speak to him for a few months, and then we started to do this Legends tour. He'd done the first one in Sheffield, but he was far too weak, so we all agreed that he, you know, he should take a rest, get himself back together. Play. Here we go. He did have a lot of scarring from his radiotherapy, which did affect him. You know, it made him um, not be able to swallow. Um, it obviously damaged his teeth, um, so he couldn't eat properly. But, you know, my dad didn't give in. He always knew he wanted anything on the phone go and get you, it'll bring it down, you know. But I was shocked when it did happen. Years before that, I thought he was away at different stages because he'd been so ill at different times. Uh, 
I just wasn't expecting it to happen the way it happened. I love the quote that my dad said when he said, cancer hasn't got a chance, it doesn't have a snooker cue. Because, you know, he was a fighter and he was clear from cancer when he died. This is why I'm so angry and so frustrated. So is his sisters, so is his children. Um, you know, he just wouldn't look after himself. And um, after beating throat cancer, you'd think that he tried to look after himself. But once again, the gambling was more important than the you know, sorting himself out, and uh, he just declined, and malnourishment, pneumonia, and unfortunately he passed away. But we did everything that we could, so we did, for him, and he knew that, so we did. But he, he did tell us, like, didn't he? <laughs> he says, when I go, he says, you thought George Best's funeral was bad when you see what you have to sort out for me. He says you're going to have plenty on your hands whenever I go, he says. The way Belfast came out for my dad's funeral was absolutely amazing. And, you know, it was so emotional to go through the streets. There was happiness, there was sadness, there was... There was a whole lot of mixed emotions. The clapping went on for at least 20 minutes from the house to the actual church. It was amazing. As you knew he was the people's champion, the people were letting him know on that particular day what they thought of him, which was very gripping. It was. And he'd have loved the horses, so he would have, most definitely. That's right. So he would. That there was just the icing on the cake for him, the horses. My dad would have liked the fact that everyone was there, because he said that he wanted a, a bigger funeral than George Best. <laughs> so he would have liked the fact that everyone came out. And, um, yeah, I think he would have been proud of it. The public decides who its heroes are going to be, uh, and, and Alex was one of them. When they made Alex Higgins, they threw away the mould. He was a bit unique as a snooker player, and he certainly was unique as a, a human being as well. I just remember him from being the person that the crowds who like to shout, come on the hurricane, come on Alex. That's how I remember Alex. He loved his gambling, he loved his smoking, he loved his drinking, he loved everything, he loved everything. He, he must have worn out two bodies, easy. Will be missed. Alex had the most talent out of any snooker player I've ever seen play. I'm a fan and I love him and you know he was just um, a great sportsman. Three words for Alex. Great snooker player. That's all that has to be said really. Frustrating, 